what I'd like to do is welcome Dr. Alex back onto stage. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a medical practitioner. I retired. And I retired because of a catastrophic illness. I suffered a ruptured right middle cerebellar artery aneurysm back here in 1987. I was treated by the best physicians in the world. I was operated on. I was in the OR about nine hours. But I was left with many, many disabilities, including constant pain, memory problems, memory loss, uh, difficulties with communication, all kinds of problems. And I was classed by insurance companies for 12 years as totally disabled. I was doing some volunteer work, and a secretary actually came up to me and said, I've got something that might help you get better. After 12 years of having the best therapies in the world, the best physicians, the best allopathic care you could ever imagine, I was not getting better. I was, I was functional. I could do a few things. I could volunteer a bit. I could drive a car, but I had to rest every couple of hours. And this layperson comes up to me and says, I've got something that might help you. And naturally, I was very skeptical. I poo-pooed it, and, but I was desperate because I had tried all the therapies in the world. Uh, chiropractic, psychotherapy, speech therapy, uh, physiotherapy, acupuncture, all kinds of things, and I just was not improving. I had reached the plateau at about seven or eight years, and I just didn't get any better after that. But being desperate, I decided I would try these products, and literally it was in four and a half months from being unable to function in any really useful capacity, I suddenly started getting my life back. I was alive before, but I had really no quality of life. After four and a half months, which was totally unexpected by me, suddenly I became pain-free, not having to use thousands and thousands of dollars worth of various medications for various things. Uh, I, my memory has come back. My paresthesias, that's feeling my feet have come back. My cognitive abilities have come back. All kinds of things that I was told would never get better suddenly start improving. And uh, for those reasons, I certainly believe in these products and I'm, I'm passionate about them in the sense that I want to get the message out as much as, as, much as possible because there, there absolutely is stuff out there that goes beyond what allopathic medicine has to offer. Allopathic medicine, as you know, is trained and we as physicians are trained we don't do anything about prevention. And that doesn't matter. We, you come to me with a sickness or a problem or a health challenge and I will fix you. That doesn't work. I mean, we've, we've done it for many, many years and it just does not work on chronic conditions. Certainly, physicians in the Western world are trained in acute care medicine, surgical medicine, trauma medicine, absolutely first class. No question about it. Therapeutic preventative medicine, we're not really taught that. Nutrition, we get no nutritional training whatsoever in med school, and there is no interest in nutrition, nutritional training, nutritional benefits being taught in uh, medical schools, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that as, as the afternoon goes on. There, are, we've heard of the genome, and the genome is the information or the study of genetic conditions. You know, 35, 40,000 genes, they just identified them a year or so ago. They're still not quite sure how many genes there are, and they're not quite sure what gene does what. However, this is a great field of study. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on studying the genome, and which is all very good. However, there's a new study or a new science coming out called glynomics. It is the way the genes transcribe information from one cell to another cell. And this is coming about, and it has to do with these things called monosaccharides, how the monosaccharides affect intercellular communication. In other words, your cell, your genes can be telling you one thing, but it's like a cell phone. You know, 
different cell, but a cell phone, telephone line, radio, whatever, if you have static on the line, for whatever reason, the information isn't going to get to the next level of cellular communication. You know, a mobile phone, if, if you run out of uh, the ability for your mobile phone to transcribe information to the re repeating station, to the next repeating station, and so forth, eventually you're not going to get the message through. And that actually can happen in cells as well. If you don't have the repeater stations or the ability for one cell to talk to another cell, it just is the message isn't going to get through. And this can lead to so-called congenital abnormalities. The gene is okay, but the transcription of the gene information to the next cell doesn't occur. And that is you know, normally called a uh, congenital disorder. We've noticed improvements in, and this, these have been published in various places, there's research being done on genetic diseases that have improved with nutritional uh, intervention. The, this was published in the US uh, publication MD News. It shows a little girl with Down syndrome, which is a genetic disorder, and after a few years on uh, glyconutritional supplements, monosaccharides, her actual facial features have changed, which isn't supposed to happen. Her mental capability has improved, which isn't supposed to happen. And from being in a category of subnormal mental capacity, she's now attending, I understand, a regular school class, which that's not supposed to happen at all. Something else that happens in this world is when I went through med school, I, I graduated in 1962, autism was a rare, rare, rare disease. One in 10,000, you know, even 20 years ago, one in 10,000 kids had autism. Well, <laughs> there's an interesting, and, and, and I bring this up because people say, well, you're making up these stories. Well, read Time Magazine, May 6, 2002, discussing autism. One in 150 kids now have symptoms of autism. What happened? One to 10,000 to one in 150. Something's wrong. Now, all these publications, you know, attest to the fact that there's something going on, but they don't know what it is. And in my opinion, that's because we're not having the proper nutrition. If you don't feed the body, it's not going to be able to replicate, repair, cleanse, heal, all those kind of things that cells do. Scientific American in uh, July 2002 talked about sweet medicine. Drug companies are spending tens and hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get artificial sugar uh, type therapeutic pharmaceuticals. Very fine. They want to take a natural sugar. They, drug companies know that these monosaccharides help, but they're not going to tell our physicians because they do not have a product that they can patent that is going to uh, you know, be able to alter, interfere, or whatever with a natural process to give a therapeutic, quote, therapeutic benefit. Drug companies have spent numerous, multi-million dollar research trying to change the, uh, the way the sugar reacts, the way the sugar maybe communicate, and yet they're unable to because the sugar molecule is so complex that they just can't do it. They recognize that uh, you know these are great therapeutic benefit. In fact, uh, Dr. John Axford from the University of uh, London, the Royal Society of Medicine, that says these sugar molecules or these monosaccharides are the molecules of the next decade as far as research in, in medicine goes. There's a textbook, and I'll show this to be up on one of my slides after uh, written, the edited, and the chapter on monosaccharides is written by a Dr. R. K. Murray. He's a professor emeritus in the University of Toronto in Canada. And he says, and I quote, all diseases are manifestations of abnormalities of molecules, chemical processes, or reactions. Every disease, it doesn't matter what you call it, starts at the molecular cellular level. And it only makes sense that if you provide something that helps your cells, 
And the cells are infinitely wisdom compared to us human beings in total. Cells know more how to replicate, heal, repair, cleanse, and, and communicate than we do. But if you provide something that gives your body, gives each cell in your body the capability of fixing itself, it's going to help any condition you can name. It doesn't matter what you call it, whether it's an autoimmune disorder, a cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, a genetic disorder, a metabolic disorder, whatever. If your cells can fix themselves with the proper nutrition, that condition is going to improve. It doesn't matter whether you call it, uh, and I like Dr. Steve Nugent's term in the medical lingo that he says you can call it concus of the boncus and it still get better. I mean, it's, it's just going to get better because you, you are helping your own cells uh, replicate, heal, and uh, do everything that cells know how to do much better than, than we do. One of the questions I also uh, get asked is sometimes people take these products, these nutrients, and they go through all kinds of symptoms. They said, my God, I took this and I got such a terrible cold. I've never had a cold like this. What's the matter with this junk? And I says, hey, that's great. That's wonderful. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Well, you know, when your immune system has been depleted, and there's actual studies, and I'll show them a little later on as well. When your immune system has been depleted over the years, it does not have the capability to fight off a virus, a bacterial infection, or whatever. And then when you start providing the nutrition for your cells to be able to wake up the immune system, it suddenly attacks the virus with a vengeance, and you may get symptoms that you haven't felt for years. And that is a good thing, because once you go through that, your immune system starts doing what it's supposed to do, next time you may not even get a cold or a flu or whatever. And just from personal experience, many times I'd flown in the past, and I would always get a cold or something because sure as shoot, and the guy sitting behind you is coughing all over the place, or the child next is sneezing and snuffling or whatever, and I always used to get colds. I take these supplements now, and all the tens of thousands and probably now hundreds of thousands of miles I've flown, I've not had a cold once. I mean, I, I take some of these products prior to getting onto the airplane. I increase my, the amounts that I take, and uh, I take a little bit of colostrum, which is, again, one of these natural supplements, and I haven't even had a cold in the last while. How many here have experienced a wonderful thing called shingles? Has anybody ever experienced that? No? Yeah. It's painful, isn't it? and it lasts a long time. It's a viral condition attacking the nerve root and the dorsal ganglia of the spinal cord. Not just for you guys. <laughs> you want to remember that and you know, explain it to your, to your neighbor when you say, oh, I've got shingles. <laughs> I had the unfortunate <laughs> experience of a dorsal root ganglion viral infection called shingles. Nothing medicine can do about it, and it frequently lasts with extreme pain six months, a year, sometimes even permanently. Uh, I went to my physician, and he really had nothing to offer me. And again, I was on these, I started upping the amount of nutritional substance that I took. Lo and behold, less than a month, all my symptoms had cleared, all the rashes cleared, and the vesiculation, and so forth. So what I'm saying is when you wake up your immune system, when it's in the recovery phase, you may get conditions, but you wake up your immune system, then it can function and actually attack through cellular uh, benefits, these, these substances giving your cells the capability of healing themselves, it can attack the virus or what have you. So uh, many conditions you aid, just don't experience, or you recover uh, much, much quicker. Something else I, I want to mention, just so you don't get the idea that I'm knocking physicians or I'm knocking pharmaceuticals or anything. Pharmaceuticals have sometimes life-saving benefits. Not all pharmaceuticals are bad. However, the overuse of pharmaceuticals should not uh, occur, but unfortunately it does. So there's, uh, I guess I've, I've said this earlier in, in my presentation this morning, Physicians in North America, and I keep repeating this because they are the best trained anywhere, and they do fantastic work. Pharmacists, and there's a website, and you can pick this up in 
what I found through Medline, Medscape, and I can't remember the exact site, but there are over 3,000 pharmaceutical papers written by pharmacists attesting to the fact that when you add glyconutritionals to your normal regimen of therapy, whatever it is, that there is a synergistic benefit by adding the nutritional substances to the therapeutic benefits of whatever pharmaceutical. In fact, and they, they say that as your cells get better, you can reduce and decrease the amount of pharmaceutical that may be necessary, and this is up to your physician to monitor that, obviously. The other thing is that these cells, and I'll cover that a little more, are these products, these supplements, help every cell get better, and in such terrible therapeutic regimens as, and I'm not saying they're, they're not necessary, but chemotherapy, radiation therapy for cancers, the, these substances actually help the cells, the healthy cells, protect themselves against the ravages of chemo or radiation, and there's a way that they increase the effectiveness of these therapies on the cancer cells. So there is a benefit even in such devastating diseases as cancers with the benefit and usage of these uh, nutritional substances. What I want to do is, I, I've got a number of slides here, and I'll put this up again. This, this was up this morning, but this is so important. Why physicians do not know about uh, nutrition? And I will read it, it says, although nowadays few things tend to preoccupy us more constantly than what we ought to be eating or not eating, there are few subjects of less interest to medical curriculum planners than nutrition. No interest whatsoever in treating or teaching nutrition in medical schools. Now, somehow, I mean, in the automobile, they, they spend millions of dollars, the oil companies, on making better gas that might get you a tenth of a mile better or whatever fuel economy, and yet the food, the nutrition, the fuel for your body, there's no interest at all of teaching this in medical school. It says, for there's a long-standing belief that a healthful diet is merely a matter of common sense and need not be complicated by science. Doesn't that make sense? Don't worry about it. Yeah, you know, just eat, you'll be fine. They used to tell us that about vitamin C and vitamin E and all these things 40 and 50 years ago. They, they said, oh, you take vitamins and all you're going to do is excrete them out of whatever orifice in your body, whether it's liquid or solid or whatever. And now, 50 years later, suddenly people are starting to pay attention to Dr. Linus Pauling, who said vitamin E is a good, or vitamin C is a good antioxidant. People should take it and they will feel better. And th that is the case. The important part, this was written just a year ago, November the 10th of 2001. That means even now, doctors coming out are not taught nutrition. And we go to our physician, many of us do, and rightly so, well, uh, my friend told me that this powder might help. What do you think of it? Some physicians will look at it and say, well, gee, you know, that looks interesting. I'll look it up and figure it out. And whether they agree with it or disagree with it, but if they've looked at it and made a professional opinion, well, that's their opinion. But if they condemn it without even looking at it, that's, that is arrogant. Condemnation without investigation is the height of arrogance. And because they're not taught nutrition, you know, physicians, and me included, have big egos. If we didn't have big egos, we couldn't do the work we're doing because we're dealing with life and death every day every minute of every day. And, you know, unless you absolutely believe what you're doing is proper, you couldn't function as a healthcare professional. But my contention is that every physician should look at every possible therapeutic modality without condemning it, and then make a decision whether it's good or bad or whatever. But knowing what I just showed you, that there's no training in nutrition, and yet we go to our physicians and ask their opinion whether this stuff is going to be of any benefit or not. In actual fact, you guys probably know more about it than your physician does. Your veterinarian gets many times more. I mean, he gets a lot of nutritional training. People feed their cats and dogs and pets better than we feed ourselves in, in many cases. We're not calorie deficient. 
we are nutrient deficient. And we are nutrient deficient because of all the things, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. Uh, our foods aren't as nutritious as they used to be. Picking foods green for transport, you know, by green I mean not ripened. Um, pesticides, herbicides, storage, all these things have depleted our nutrient supply. And as our nutrient supply has depleted, our incidence of chronic diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases, all kinds of conditions has increased. And this can be correlated with, with our depleted nutrients in our, in our average uh, food chain that we have. And, you know, over the years, and this is a terrible statistic, heart disease is the number one killer. Cancers are the number two killer, strokes number three, but the interesting part is adverse drug reactions are the fourth leading cause of death in North America. Properly prescribed, non-error adverse reactions to drugs is the fourth leading cause of death in this country. Now, something's wrong when you're killing the equivalent of a jet plane falling out of the sky every day in North America by drugs that are properly prescribed. And yet we blithely go along and say, well, that's okay, I, I, I don't mind. I mean, I'm, I'm taking these drugs, doctor prescribed them. They're double-blinded, whatever. But they don't realize, and I get this many, many times from physicians and lay people, well, where are your double-blind studies? I said, well, there are a few being done. However, you know, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money. The average double-blind study on a pharmaceutical costs anywhere from 10 to 50 million dollars and takes 10 to 12 years to complete. And the rule is, and this is for any new product coming out, you have to produce what they call toxicity studies. And you have to go through all these stages and what have you of killing so many people, 50% of the lab animals have to be killed by the toxic effects of whatever you're producing. And eventually they work through with a pharmaceutical and it costs on average something like 500 million to a billion dollars to bring out a pharmaceutical product to the market. And as I showed this morning that in, in this publication, and this is the Canadian Family Physician Journal, and this is published in September of this year, and it was talking about, uh, the heading was pharmaceuticals, proceed with caution. So the, the medical community is starting to wake up a little bit, but it said on the back here, as some of you have heard this morning, 80% of new products or new clinical uses of approved products each year have absolutely no therapeutic benefit over what has been had before. In other words, they're pushing stuff, re Reformulated, uh, recalculated, one molecule changed off somewhere and saying, oh, this is a new drug, it has so many great, wonderful benefits, and it's nonsense. Only 2% of new therapeutic modalities approved each year have any basic therapeutic benefit over what has gone before, and yet our drug costs are going up, everything is going up. The point I'm also trying to make is that drug A is double blinded, drug B is double blinded. Drug C is double blinded. However, a lot of people are on three, four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve different pharmaceuticals. None of them together are double blinded. So you have no idea of what interreaction there may be from one pharmaceutical to another pharmaceutical. So uh, double blinding does not mean safety. 106,000 people a year in North America are killed by these drugs that have been double-blinded by adverse reactions that weren't even considered or weren't found in any uh, studies that, that, that were done. And here's my old friend, 500 years ago, Mr. Paracelsus, who said, everything that man needs to uh, sustain good health is provided in nature, and it is the job of science to find it. And one of the scientists that found it was Dr. Bill McAnally, and he did the original work on the aloe vera plant, the mannose, the polymannose, and his studies were initially commissioned by the United States uh, 
Army or, or, the, or the Department of Defense, and they were looking for something that would heal radiation burns because the original research was starting during the Cold War years when there was a great danger of many people suffering radiation burns, and the U.S. military wanted something that would heal this. And the only thing that would heal radiation burns was the polymanos derived from the aloe vera plant. And uh, they tried all kinds of other stuff, but it was only fresh aloe vera. And Dr. McAnally discovered a way to stabilize the aloe vera molecule. So there was an enzyme that he blocked that didn't, uh, you know, break down the aloe vera. And this uh, stabilized aloe vera polymanos is, in, in fact, in these supplements that we're talking about. But they went to, when they discovered this, Dr. Bill went to the U.S. Uh, Drug Administration said, you know, we've got something really important here, and it works on, and he listed, you know, helps viral conditions, helps bacterial, may uh, assist in uh, cancer therapies and all that, and the FDA says, oh, ho, 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 you've got to prove toxicity. If you're going to market to health benefits, you've got to prove there's toxicity to this, otherwise we can't uh, uh, sanction it as of therapeutic benefits. So part of that is you have to kill half the little animals. And all drugs are toxic, so you have to produce toxicity. So Bill and his group went ahead and tried to prove toxicity. And they fed it to little rats and mice, and yeah, they got better. None of them got sick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're doing their push-ups and their weightlifting and everything, and they're all healthy. And so they went back to the FDA and said, well, there is no toxicity. And the FDA says, well, you know, there, there has to be toxicity if it's going to be a benefit. You have to have toxicity. So they went through all the tests again, and one little sucker died. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Bill's happy. I can just imagine. Bill's about this tall, and at that time, he was rather rotund. And, you know, Bill's happy as heck. He's killed a rat. You know? So the FDA says, oh, oh, just a minute. Why did that rat die? Maybe it didn't die from the condition or the stuff you're giving it. You have to do an autopsy. So Bill gladly conceded or agreed, and he did an autopsy, and that little sucker drowned. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the FDA in its wisdom says you can't make any health claim benefits for this because you can't prove toxicity. And the point I'm trying to make is there is absolutely no toxic effects from these monosaccharides because they are food that your body is designed, the good Lord designed your body to use these as food. And they're only produced in plants. They're not produced artificially. They can't be produced. They're too complex. They're only produced by plants. And these plants are what? Uh, they're natural, and they have no toxic effects proven by the FDA. Therefore, they're totally safe, and that's irrefutable. So now we know. We know that every cell in the human body benefits from a well-balanced nutrition. We know that you need proteins. You know you need amino acids, and there's essential proteins and amino acids that have been there's, uh, known for a number of years. In the last 30 or 40 years, we've realized that you need multivitamins. You need the A's and the B's and the C's and the B6's and the B12's and all these. We know now, and doctors admit to the fact, that you need vitamins and micronutrients, the minerals, the calcium, the magnesium, the manganese, the copper, the seleniums, and all this. You need that for proper cellular function and neuronal transmission. We also know that you need essential fatty acids. You don't need uh, hydrogenated fat. You need essential fatty acids like omega-3, omega-6, occurring in olive oil, flaxseed oil, deep-sea fish, salmon, tuna, and so forth. But we are becoming uh, deficient in a lot of these. Now, these three things we've been trying to rectify. We've been trying to, or pharmaceuticals have been trying to make us wonder or cure them, if you would. And yet, all our disease conditions are increasing. All the chronic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, uh, inflammatory conditions, all these chronic diseases Autoimmune diseases have been increasing in incidence. When I went through med school, there were eight identified autoimmune diseases. Last count, there was 81 
identified autoimmune diseases. Why? Something is missing, and it appears the missing link are these sugars. And it says here, anti-aging formula. There have been studies done showing that the parameters of aging, blood pressure, bone density, lean muscle mass, f less fat cells, uh, all these conditions that are associated with aging can actually be reduced or even reversed given proper nutrition. I mean, I'm not saying we're not going to die. I mean, we're all going to do that thing. Whether we like it or not, everybody dies. But if you can postpone, if you can postpone the parameters of degenerative diseases that occur in about the sixth decade, you can actually postpone them and reverse them by using proper nutrition, having a better quality of life. For that reason alone, wouldn't it be wise to take these products that are no longer available in, in, our, in our standard diets? So, very important just from that point alone. So basically, sickness and health are both cellular events. As Dr. Murray says, all diseases all conditions are manifestations of abnormalities of molecules, chemical processes, or chemical reactions at the cellular level. So every disease uh, is, starts at the cellular level. So you ask yourself, well, how do I know whether I'm healthy or not? Well, I can give you guys, I'm not saying you should do this, but I can give you guys one sure way of finding out if you're healthy or not. You go to your physician and you ask for one of these. I'm not saying you should do <laughs> I'm not saying you should do it, but you can find out whether you're healthy or not. This is basically a cell. Inside the cell, you have a nucleus, which has your DNA and your RNA. You have a cell wall that encapsulates or keeps the cell together. A cell is like a little jelly. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Inside this jelly-like stuff called cytoplasm, there's all kinds of these other little things. And I'll name a few, but they're basically little factories that occur in every cell in your body. And there's about 200 of them in every cell in your body. I mean, remember, this is a microscopic little gizmo that you have to multiply and magnify four or 500 times before you can even see it in a microscope. And there's 200 little silly little factories inside, or more in some cells, inside every cell. Extremely complex. And yet some physicians, myself included, I used to think, well, I know what happened in there. I mean, it's all, yeah, I mean, cell does this, that, that, and so forth. We have no idea of the exact molecular interaction within that cell. We know some of the things that happen in there, but we don't know all the complexity of all the reactions that go inside. And these little factories can be called centrioles, Golgi apparatus, endothelial reticulums, uh, mitochondria, all these little factories inside there work to produce what your cells are designed to do. Now, just to show you, a cell wall is not a like a piece of plastic wrap, what, you know, sarin wrap, I don't know what brands you have here, but a plastic wrap that you put over your uh, food bowl to keep the, you know, stuff fresh or whatever. A cell wall is composed of a whole bunch of molecules. In the cell wall itself, there are transport channels allowing stuff to come in when the stuff is worked over inside to let the nutrient material, whatever the cell produces, to come out. In actual fact, Dr. Uh, Blobel, in 1999, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine, how stuff gets into a cell, what happens, and how it gets out. I mean, there is basic, basic research done on these glyconutrients and all the cellular structures and so forth. The other thing I want you guys to remember is this little sucker here. He's called a carbohydrate receptor site. Many, many years, we didn't even know those existed. So when the original research was being done on these carbohydrates and how they interact, the skeptics said, oh, there's nothing there. How can you say that these sugars have something to do? They're just for energy, and they have nothing to do with cellular communication. The reason they said that, we had no way of identifying these carbohydrate receptor sites. So obviously, you can't see them. 
They, they can't exist. It doesn't matter. They, they're just not there. How can you say they do something when we don't even know they're there? However, we have found, science has found that in fact, there are carbohydrate receptor sites and they are very, very visible. Science Magazine, in their publication last year in March, showed and devoted the whole issue in March of 2001, and this is a cell, and these are those carbohydrate receptor sites, and this is one that's enlarged, but the cell has thousands of these carbohydrate receptor sites that we didn't even know about before. And the skeptics were saying, well, the carbohydrates can't do nothing. I mean, we can't see them, therefore they can't exist. Well, that's the old ostrich sort of syndrome. There are receptor sites, and as Science Magazine said, saving lives with sugar. You know, <laughs> taking a spoonful of medicine, you know, sugar, who, who was it? Uh, yeah, spoons full of sugar makes medicine go down, and that, that may be uh, very true. Yeah, that was Julie Andrews. This is showing the cell wall, these receptor sites, the monosaccharides, which come into your body as food, going through the transport channel, going through a metabolic interconversion, going through, again, another of these little factories called the Golgi, and out the transport channel, attaching onto a couple of proteins, these eight sugars attach onto that, and the alphabet of transcription of information occurs here to the next cell, to the next cell, and all 300 or so trillion cells that you have in the body eventually all uh, communicate with every other cell. And this is just to show the complexity of these uh, monosaccharides and what they can do. These are normal cells. You notice they have all this little fuzz. Well, until we had the electron scanning microscope, we couldn't see those things. So we assumed they didn't exist, and so did all the researchers that were looking at this, particularly the skeptics of this. However, with the electron uh, microscope, scanning microscope, we can actually take one of these little fuzzies and look at it, and look how complex that is. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. The complexity of these molecules is astounding, and, and I'll, I'll give you some figures a little later on. The importance of these sugars to make a new cell. You have to have a blueprint, and you have to have the factories. I mean, if you're making a cabinet, if you're making a car, if you're making a piece of machinery, you need a blueprint, and you need a factory, and you need an assembly line. Simple. Okay. You have your assembly line, you have your blueprint, which is the DNA and the RNA, which takes a little segment of the DNA photographs that are copies that, you know, makes your new cell. You need amino acids, you need the proteins. The important part here, and this work was done by Kornfeld and Kornfeld about 12 years ago, and it was published in a, in a scientific journal. The third step before your cell can replicate is mannose 6-phosphate, one of the eight essential monosaccharides coming from the aloe vera plant. Mannose is absolutely mandatory. You can't make a new cell unless you have mannose. Otherwise, the factory stops. There's no more production. They've gone on strike. There's no mannose. There's no parts. You can't build a new cell. You can't build a new car unless you have wheels and an engine and all that. So the fourth step coming through the Golgi apparatus is the seven other monosaccharides. In other words, unless you have all eight monosaccharides, you cannot build a properly effective functioning cell. All eight monosaccharides are absolutely mandatory and necessary. Otherwise, you can maybe build a cell, but it's like building a car and one wheel is missing. Yeah, the engine will run, but the cell isn't going to function properly in all other aspects. You can push it along, and maybe you can get a little bit down the way, but your functioning cell is not going to be working properly. So you need all eight monosaccharides to get a properly functioning cell. That is the importance of these uh, monosaccharides. Now, I, was, I keep saying cells have to communicate. These, this is a cell again. That's your cell wall. These are the uh, carbohydrate receptor sites. And this was printed or published in 1990 in the Biotechnology Journal. And Dr. Hodgson said, almost without exception, 
whenever two cells interact in a specific way, cell surface carbohydrates will be involved. Without exception, cell surface carbohydrates will be involved. Now, when I went through school, they said glucose only. All sugars, all carbohydrates, be it from pasta, be it from bread, be it anything, any starch, turns to glucose. Glucose is only used for energy, and then it's interconverted to these other things that may be necessary. Well, that's, that has been proven totally wrong. You know, last year's medical dogma is today's medical fallacy. I mean, we know that from all over and over the years. And, you know, can you guys believe, some, some of you people that are my age may remember when doctors used to tell people to smoke if they had a throat condition. Well, it'll soothe your throat. It's good for you. It'll help you relax. Well, last year's medical dogma is this year's medical fallacy. Hormone replacement therapy just recently. All these years we've been talking and doctors have been saying, oh, take hormones, they're good for you. First time they've ever done a proper epidemiological study, they find out hormone replacement therapy with artificial hormones, altered natural hormones, are absolutely dangerous. In fact, they stopped the study in midstream because they found that this stuff was too dangerous. So what they thought was correct or assumed was correct, we find out is absolutely wrong. The same with the glucose-only theory. We know now that it is not correct. And this study was published uh, in 1998 in a biochemistry journal, and it said through radioactive labeling, galactose and mannose were injected or taken by the individual and found to be absorbed from the gut directly into the bloodstream and taken to the cells where they are utilized with any, without any inter, uh, conversions of any kind within the digestive system. In other words, galactose, these eight monosaccharides are absorbed through your gut, utilized directly without your, any changes within the liver and so forth. So it proved that the glucose only theory was absolutely wrong. Acta anatomica is uh, one of the major biological or biochemistry, cellular physiology, and cellular anatomy journals in the world. And this was a publication from 1998. And the important thing is, you know, this journal, it's about yay thick. You have to be absolutely conversant in the language of glycobiology, biochemistry, and so forth. And if you want to go, if any of you healthcare pr practitioners here want to go to bed and sleep, start reading this and you'll, you'll go to sleep very quickly. I mean, it's, it's really deep stuff. So what I do is I, you know, I'm not saying I'm bright or anything, but I go to the summary. That's always easier to read summaries than it is to, to read the whole articles. And this journal is about an inch, inch and a quarter thick, which means it's about 250, 300 pages long and it would take study of years to be able to even understand this. So I go to the back where the summary comes out and says, it's talking about, about glycosylation or, or the way these sugars act. And it says, monosaccharides represent an alphabet of biological information similar to amino acids and nucleic acids, but with unsurpassed coding capability. I'll explain that a little bit. Unsurpassed, nothing can equal the coding capability of these sugars. We all know the genome, There's, as I said about 30,000, they think 30, 35, maybe 40,000 genes. Each gene has nucleotides in this sort of double helix ladder. You know, it sort of folds over on itself. Each nucleotide is connected to three others. In other words, each step of this he uh, helix ladder con is composed of four nucleotides. Now, these four doesn't mean there's only four possibilities. They figured out that of these four, they can be put together in 256 different ways. Now, we've known that proteins are necessary, and there's 20 some odd, I believe it's 20, actual essential amino acids, proteins. So each set of proteins reacting with these nucleotides can actually, and I'm not a mathematician, I took this out of the Scientific American, can produce approximately 16,000 bits of information that can be transferred from one cell to another. 
So from 24 things, you've got 16,000 different combinations that you can put together. Each sugar is a six-sided, three-dimensional molecule, and according to Scientific American, each individual sugar has the potential capability of transmitting 15 million, not thousands, 15 million different bits of information. It can be transposed onto these uh, proteins in 15 million different ways. So, you mathematicians out there, what's 256 times 16,000 times 15 million, that's roughly 2.4 trillion potential capabilities of transmission of information from one cell to another. They can't even figure out how many genes there is, and yet there's physicians out there that tell me that I'm absolutely wet when I'm saying the cellular communication is, as Act Anatomic says, unsurpassed coding capability. Nothing out there is, uh, has been shown to be able to transmit as much information as uh, these uh, monosaccharides. And this is Act Anatomic again, and it says that these sugars will impact or leave its footprints on virtually all fields of biology and medicine, not only in immunology, but in general cell biology, developmental and reproductive biology, and neurobiology. In other words, these sugars affect every aspect of your physiological well-being in your body. Your physicians say, well, you know, you can't validate this. Well, there is validation, and this is an American publication called the the Physician's Desk Reference Manual for Non-Prescription drugs, drugs and Dietary Supplements, and these supplements are actually listed in this publication, which every doctor in uh, the U.S. gets. A lay publication, Dr. Mandoa, a very nice chap, he's uh, a brilliant man, I know this chap personally, and he wrote this book because he was finding results in his patients with sugars. And so he started researching this, and he actually wrote, wrote this book. Another book called The Miracle Sugars, and it talks about all these diseases that can be associated uh, with Im uh, impaired immunity. In other words, if your immune system isn't working right, you're prone to all these various conditions. And this is, again, a publication that, that is available. And these, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So where does health begin? Well, you know, when I was in med school, they said, well, talk to the patient, find out his symptoms, and then figure out what's wrong with him, and then give him X drug, and they'll get better. They didn't take that a step further, saying that, you know, eventually your body's going to heal itself, and this pharmaceutical will, you know, stop symptoms or mask symptoms, but it's not going to heal you. They didn't tell us that. However, we know that from what Dr. Murray said, all conditions start at the cellular level. If you have healthy cells, you have healthy tissues, you have healthy organs, and your whole body is healthy. So if you have a condition, and you can make the cell, if, say if this cell is not healthy, is medically challenged with whatever, if you can have the cell itself repair itself, then, you know, your cell will get healthier, your tissues will get healthier, and uh, you will get healthier. So health begins, or is lost, at the cellular level. So why do we become sick? We get sick because we're starved. We're starved of nutrition. And I've had people ask me, well, uh, you, you talk about nutrition depletions. Can you back this up? Well, you go to the UN, World Health Organization site on the internet, and you can find this information. They state that agricultural, commercial agricultural fields, and I'm talking about North America, and it's probably the same all over the world, agricultural fields are nutritionally becoming deficient. And the reason for this is overutilization. Food, the, the soils aren't allowed to replace themselves. They take the plants off, they strip it off, they, they don't put the nutrients, the natural nutrients back in, and they provide stuff that'll make the plant grow quicker and look healthier, but it doesn't mean it has a nutrition. Most fertilizers in North America are the NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, very few farmers that I'm aware of 
supply the other nutrients like the seleniums, the manganese, the magnesiums, the copper, the iron, etc., etc., etc. So you may give nitrogen and phosphorus, it makes your lawn grow very nice, but it doesn't mean that the food produced on these soils is nutritionally complete. The Canadian Medical Association Journal just a couple of weeks ago produced an article and published it showing the depletion of nutrients in our agricultural products. And because I'm from a fruit growing area, I was more interested in that. And it said in 1940s and 50s, you could eat two peaches and get almost all the nutrient from those for your daily requirement of your vitamins and so forth that the peaches produce. They said now you have to eat 25 peaches to get the same nutrient benefit. Our soils have been depleted. The nutritional quality in the fruit is not there that it was uh, prior. So we pick our produce green. In other words, we don't allow it to ripen. And these micronutrients and monosaccharides are only produced as the plants ripen. We process the heck out of our foods. You, you go to your superstore, and I'm sure it's the same here as it is in Canada, and 90% at least of all the produce out there has been processed. It's in packages, it's been stripped of nutrients. I, you know, the, the classic example is white flour. It says enriched. They stripped off 17 nutrients, they put in back a little bit of iron, a little bit of B12, and they call it enriched and it's good for you. They've taken away all the fiber, they've taken away the niacin, they've taken away a whole bunch of stuff, but they say it's enriched, therefore it's good for you. They, they've, they've made virtually a sterile food by sterile, I mean non-nutritious food other than calories, and uh, they're giving this to us as, as being uh, good for us. We're poisoned by toxins. Even organically grown stuff is very, very difficult in, the, in our world now because the environmental pollutants are all over the world, even in the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, polar bears, surprisingly, are becoming less uh, reproductive. They, they're not producing as many offspring. Now, this can be from genetic factors, it can be from nutritional factors, it can be from lack of food or whatever, but they also found things like DDT, uh, pesticides, uh, uh, PCBs in the cells of polar bears. And you don't have to be a polar bear to have that. Each and every one of us in our cells carries anywhere from 300 to 500 toxic chemicals that didn't even exist. 50 years ago. There are over 40,000 chemicals that we're exposed to on a daily basis in minute amounts, but on a daily basis that affect our cells and our capability of uh, doing everything that cells are supposed to be doing. So we're toxic, we're, we're poisoned by toxicity. And even as I said, in organically grown, it's better I think, as far as you know, less toxicity in that because they're not using the pesticides and herbicides and all that stuff, but the air pollutants, the rain that comes down, affect even uh, the, the best organically grown uh, produce. We're stressed out by our jobs, by money, by the status of our health. All these things uh, produce environmental and physiological stresses and that eventually makes us uh, sick. So this, we're gonna get into a little more of the science of these monosaccharides. Eight essential sugars, eight necessary sugars, and they're glucose, galactose, xylose, fucose, mannose, and acetylglucosamine, and acetylgalactosamine, and acetylneuraminic acid. You have to have these eight, as you saw by the previous slides, to help your cells reproduce properly. Now, in our average diet, we only get two of these, two monosaccharides. So you say, well, how can, we, how can we live? Your body, and you guys can believe whatever you want to believe, and I'm not here to say evolution is right or creationism is right, but I personally have great difficulty in accepting the fact that somehow a few hundred million years ago, we, we start off as a little bit of ooze in a bottle of a mud puddle so, somewhere. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. However, I don't care what your personal philosophy is, our bodies are designed in a way that's absolutely miraculous. In our diet, we get glucose and we get galactose. We get glucose from table sugar from sucrose, 
and we get galactose from dairy products. So you get two monosaccharides. You say, well, if we only get two, how come we're not all dead? Well, your body is designed in a perfect way, and it can actually manufacture the other six. So you say, why the heck should I take this stuff? If I can make it, <laughs> why should I go out and buy it? Well, it takes an awful, awful lot of physiological biochemical energy, ATP, in your cells to produce these other sugars. And if an enzyme is missing that is part of these interconversion reactions, you're not going to make that sugar exactly properly, and you're going to have either a um, cell that's not quite formed correctly, or the communication capability will be different, therefore you're going to have more disease processes or more cellular abnormalities and all these other things that I've been talking about of our chronic diseases and what have you. So just to give you an idea, there's 37 inter metabolic interreactions that have to occur in the liver to change glucose into one of the other monosaccharides. And just to give you an idea, and this is a simplified version of what happens in your metabolic interconversions, to go from galactose or glucose through all these enzymatic interreactions to get down to fucose, that takes an awful lot of energy. And one of the things that people first notice when they start on these monosaccharides, they suddenly start having more energy because you're not wasting it doing all this stuff. And then if you have an enzyme that isn't quite working right for whatever reason, the end product isn't as perfect as it should be, and you're going to have either a congenital malformation of some kind if it's in utero, or you're going to have a condition that isn't responding as it should, so you're going to have all kinds of problems. That is why you have to take these. And the American Medical Association just recently came out with a statement saying that our North American diets are deficient, and the only way you can get all the nutrients you need is through supplementation. The American Pediatric Society said that a few years ago as well, and I alluded to that this morning in my talk, that kids do not eat a proper nutritious diet, and we're eating a lot of calories, we're eating a lot of kind of other stuff, because we're not getting nutrition, we're not getting the satiation that we need from our diets, so we tend to pack on more calories along with all the other stuff, the fats and everything else, so we're becoming a nation of obesity. In the U.S. and in Canada, 60% of people are overweight, 25% to 30% are grossly obese. And we saw where is Max here? He was a guy about this big around. He almost needed two airplane seats to sit in it before he could go any place. Once he started proper nutrition and looking after himself, I mean, this guy is in pretty good condition for an old man of 60 some odd or whatever he is. <laughs> We're, we're friends, so I can say that. <laughs> People say, well, you might take this as an adult. You certainly wouldn't give it to kids. And I said, why not? You realize, and, and I believe, uh, this is Stan, right? Stephen, so, sorry, Stephen. Stephen alluded to this this morning. Mom's breast milk ha is the best food Bar none, it's nature's perfect food for babies. And mom's breast milk has five of the eight monosaccharides. And there have been studies done in your neighbor country here called New Zealand over a period of 20 some odd years showing that breastfed kids are healthier than non-breastfed kids. Breastfed kids have less infections, they have less ear infections, they have healthier parameters in all fields, they are more intelligent, they grow better and they mature better and everything else, and all these benefits accrue even into adulthood just from providing the nutrition in mom's breast milk, which is the five monosaccharides, and there's 121 other monosaccharides that are easily converted into the three that are necessary. So mom's breast milk is absolutely important for kids and w from these studies, we know that it's the perfect food for children, and in actual fact, as an adult, if you want to get the same benefits of fighting, being able to fight infections, having less problems with viral conditions, being able to, for your cells to replicate properly, and all the benefits is by the use of these monosaccharides, and you get all the benefits of breast milk, even if you're an adult. Again, a very important reason uh, to take these.
when your body is given the proper foods, it can actually heal itself. Drug therapy does not heal, and it can be extremely toxic, 100,000 people a year. Every, again, this is to do with uh, what, you know, where, where your studies to show that these, in fact, nutritional substances are missing in your diet. Well, Harvard Medical School, this is the old sort of statement that everybody should eat at least five to 10 vine-ripened fruits and vegetables to prevent uh, cancer and help in the treatment of cancer and so forth. Harvard, just this last summer, said this should be doubled. In fact, Harvard made a statement in a publication a few years ago that said that uh, science fails to recognize the value of nutrition, and Harvard has said that, and they also have said that our foods are depleted along with the UN and, and, and the uh, agricultural people in the US. Now, the science of optimal health says that the body knows how to uh, maintain health and heal itself. The cell is the basic unit of the body, Healthy cells make healthy bodies, and cells communicate, and the better they communicate, the healthier uh, you will be. And I'm just going to get into the immune system a bit. An immune system basically has two things that it has to do. It has to recognize your own cells, your own self cells, and leave them alone. Obviously, your cells are doing the work they're supposed to do. And it's capable of uh, distinguishing normal from abnormal cells, and that is the sole function of your immune system. However, our immune system is falling, and this is done by actual studies, and in the last 20 years, our immune systems have been depleted in functional capability by about 25 percent. And <clears throat> also, they're studying now and finding out that we're losing our immune system function at a rate of about 2 percent per year. And you know, that has devastating effects on your total cellular uh, capability and your body able to uh, function properly, cleanse itself, heal itself, repair itself, and all those kind of things. Something else I want you to notice is that uh, in our kids, our kids aren't as healthy as they used to be. As I mentioned this morning, was the fact of cardiovascular disease. And, uh, evidence of cardiovascular disease in very, very young kids, five-year-old kids and that on autopsy. But other conditions like diabetes, uh, heart disease, as I said, autism, ADD, uh, obesity, all these conditions are increasing in our young kids because of improper uh, nutrition. So basically, cancers, heart disease, diabetes, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, MS are all autoimmune disorders, or some of them uh, are associated with autoimmune disorders, and our immune system, when it's functioning properly, helps our own bodies protect our cells from the ravages of uh, developing uh, these particular conditions. This is interesting, and these are the benefits in medical literature, third-party medical literature, that can be attained by giving these eight sugars, and some of these are in that little book, uh, uh, Miracle Sugars, in Dr. Mendoza's book, in other publications, and all these conditions, including diabetes, heart disease, hepatitis, cancers, autism, ADD, dyslexia, ear infections, yeast infections, asthma, menopause, congenital disorders, urinary infections, upper respiratory infections, strokes, cerebral palsy, depression, and organ transplant have been published in third-party journals attesting to the fact that these eight sugars can show benefit against those conditions. This is an interesting study at Dr. Uh, McDaniel and Dr. Bill McAnally, when they first start looking at these particularly the, the ACE man and the, the mano 6-phosphate, they found that in viral infections, including HIV, there was a great benefit. And these studies were done at the University of Texas, uh, at Texas A&M, Carrington Laboratories, Southern Research of Institute uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. These were university studies showing the benefits of 
these monosaccharides in viral uh, conditions. And they were so excited about this, way back in 1998, they went to an international symposium on viral conditions, an uh, AIDS conference basically, and thought that people would jump over up and down and cheer them for bringing this information because the studies that they showed was up to a 70% benefit by reduced viral counts, increased white cell counts in people that were suffering from HIV, human if immunodeficiency virus. So, you know, they thought this was wonderful. And they presented their paper and got an absolute zip reaction. Nobody picked up on it. None of the major publications picked up on it. The lay press didn't pick up on it. And they were very disappointed because first time they were showing that all the other drugs drug cocktails actually really didn't benefit these people. And they had something here that showed a potential of a 70% benefit to people suffering with these viral conditions. Nobody picked up on it, and they were very, very disappointed. There was one company, however, Solve, which it's a German company, produces vaccines for viral conditions, and particularly at that time they were working with chickens. And up to 50% of all chickens in Germany were dying from these viral conditions. And whoever was at this conference on viral diseases picked up on this, that, oh, maybe this ace man has something to do with that. Salve, this company, this scientist looked at it and said, saw the benefits. So they incorporated, this company incorporated the ace man into their vaccines. And from a 50% mortality, they achieved only a 20% mortality. In other words, many, many more chickens were alive than were present when they didn't incorporate these uh, monosaccharides into their vaccine. So, I mean, that had a huge, huge economic benefit for the agriculture industry, uh, for the chicken industry. So, <laughs> this, this isn't my comment, but Dr. Edge, when I first heard him, said, well, you know, people wouldn't listen to him. The, the AIDS societies, et cetera, wouldn't listen to him. But he says, you know, you really can't dispute six billion chickens. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a study uh, in leukemia virus in cats. Again, with these monosaccharides, there's a type of a virus that behaves something like AIDS in cats. And within 8 to 12 weeks, 70% of cats that are symptomatic die from this autoimmune disorder. They provide the monosaccharides, and right at the bottom it says there was clinically uh, 71% of treated cats were alive and in good health after 12 weeks of therapy. 70% are alive versus 70% were dead within 8 to 12 weeks. Given the monosaccharides, 70% were alive. I mean, that's got to mean something. I mean, all the cats can't be, you know, doing something that, that wasn't provided with, without these monosaccharides. This is a very, very significant slide. It doesn't look like much, but these products, the surface carbohydrates, protect your cells from infections, bacteria, viruses, toxins, help modulate your hormones and everything else, but they mediate the process of inflammation and the migration of cells during embryonic development. During embryonic development, if your cells have the proper nutrition, your embryo will develop better. In other words, your fetus is going to be healthier. Now, people ask me, well, when should we start these monosaccharides? As soon as you know you're pregnant, at the time of conception. Because given the monosaccharides helping each cell replicate, communicate, transmit information, and so forth, and migrate you know, from two cells to the couple of hundred trillion cells that are encompassed in a, in, a, in a live birth of a baby, cells have to migrate, cells have to move, cells have to intercommunicate, cells have to replicate. And if you can provide something that helps these cells do all these things, you're going to have a healthier baby. There's a doctor in Southern California who uses and recommends these products to all her pregnant patients. And I was on a conference call with her a few months ago, and her statement was that, you know, after a baby is born, there's a certain blood loss and involution problems with the uterus and so forth. And she said, on average, from a blood loss of 750 cc's, women who take these products have a much easier 
time of the pregnancy. They have an easier time of the labor and delivery, and they, on average, lose only 250 cc's of blood. I mean, that's a threefold benefit to the amount of blood loss. Babies come out healthier, they have less chronic respiratory problems and all the other things that we had talked about before. So, if you are pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant, you want the greatest chance of your baby to be healthy, start on the products. Remember, there's no toxic effect to the monosaccharides. Now, a little bit more on the science. The rats with uh, tumors, given fucose injections were found to, there was no toxic effects found to fucose treatments and it suppressed tumor growth. And this was published way, way, way back in 1971. So there was research going on even then. Antiviral activities, as I was saying, mannose, uh, the simple mannose, polymannose, ace mannan from uh, aloe vera plant, actually inhibited infections by bacteria and viruses. I mean, there's research done on this, and yet it is not accepted in the general medical community. It's accepted by the, by the uh, scientific community, but not necessarily by the medical people as yet. And I think that has lots to do with economics and everything else, because you cannot patent a natural molecule. And you may say, well, how come this company has patents. Well, they don't patent the molecules. It's a composition of matter patent, which in fact says it's not the molecule we're patenting, it's the way we process it and the way we put it together. And that is the technology that is being patented. And you know, I've had people say, well, there's other companies that, you know, there's all kinds of testimonials, they get better. Absolutely. Many of these other companies have one monosaccharide, two monosaccharides. One that I looked at, I think, had three in it. But if you're missing that particular monosaccharide, absolutely, you're, you're going to get better. But the other thing is, in, in, in the U.S. and in Canada, there are no standards of uh, manufacturing standard of efficacy in the health food industry. In other words, I can manufacture something, and I can have a source, and I may have X number percentage of whatever I'm saying is in there. However, there's no uh, standard for uh, measuring the efficacy or, or the composition or the pharma uh, pharmacological activity, if you would, of that product. And there's some 20 various uh, substances, nutritional supplements were tested. Some had as little as 0% of what was stated in the label. Some had as much as 500% of what is sta stated on the label. And these were products that were brand name. They, they weren't, you know, just some obscure thing. The company that produces these monosaccharides is, uh, the manufacturer is under pharmaceutical control standards. And they are monitored and tested at three different times during production. And every batch is of same uh, pharmacological activity and efficacy as every other batch. So there's no other company in my knowledge that can state that. So every, every batch is of same uh, activity of molecular substance as every other batch that's produced uh, in, in their manufacturing process. So I thought I'd just, just mention that. The antibacterial action, xylose in birch bark, and there was a big uh, to-do about birch bark, in the, again, in the province of BC about five or ten years ago, the great benefits of birch bark. Everybody said, well, that can't be so or anything else, but there's xylose, and xylose does have an effect on uh, antibacterial and uh, particularly in kids with ear infections. Something else, and you know, th these are little things that, just to give you an idea of how important these monosaccharides are, if you ever have the you know, misfortune of requiring a blood transfusion, just make sure that they, and, and they do, I'm, I'm not knocking the, the technology people or, 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 or the lab techs or anything else, but one sugar difference can make the difference between life and death, or mean the difference between life and death. In the three blood groups, the O antigen has a galactose and a fucose. The only difference for the A is a neuraminic acid, 
uh, or pardon me, N-acetylgalactosamine, and the B antigen or the B type blood has a galactose on here. One sugar makes a difference in all the blood groups that you have. There are other things they test for, but that's how, again, how important these uh, monosaccharides are. And this is a study done by the Royal Society of Medicine in London, England, and it was published way, 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 way back again there in 1990 of, of the effect of a monosaccharide on rheumatoid arthritis. This is a normal cell representation. On this part of the cell, you have a galactose in a normal, healthy cell. And I've actually seen a representation, a computer model of how this cell changes in shape when the galactose is removed. Now, when you remove that galactose, your body, your immune system recognizes that as not being normal. The shape is changed only by one molecule, and that affects the ability of your immune system to pick that up as being abnormal, non-self, and it's attacking this cell, this cartilage cell, and you get rheumatoid arthritis. And the study done by the Royal Society of Medicine was that when they replaced that galactose, the cartilage cell started healing itself. And this is only one aspect. Dr. John Axford now is doing what he calls sugar typing. He's developing at the, at the research level yet, but he assures me that this is going to come about in the next maybe three, five years or so, maybe longer, maybe shorter, that he's able to take a sample of your serum or your blood, figure out which sugar is missing or which is not there in sufficient amounts, and predict what diseases you may develop in five, 10, or 20 years replace that sugar at this end and prevent the diseases from developing. Think of the possibilities there, the ultimate preventive medicine. How do you prevent a disease before there's any clinical manifestations of even a hint of what is going to develop? And that is coming. There, there are all kinds of research stuff showing the various depletions and the various stuff that is not present, that we don't know about, but it's in the research uh, sort of phases now, and eventually it's going to become commonplace that we can actually predict what you need. This is another one of the slides that my students hate me for. I, I didn't mention, but I've, I've resigned my college teaching because I just don't have time to do that and do all the travels. And, you know, this is my passion to educate and hopefully affect the lives of many, many people, more so than I could do at, at you know, the one class college level or the one day college level. But when your immune system is working right, all these things work together. But just to explain it, this is a bad guy. This is a virus. It can be a cancer cell. It can be a bacteria. You know, they're always green or black or some unfortunate color. <laughs> and, and, and this guy is called a macrophage. Macro means big, phage means eat. The big eater, he's a big guy. And you can actually see him under a microscope when he sees one of these you know, bad guys that uh, Roy Rogers or whoever used to chase. You know, he identifies that because he's got little round blips on him. Those are his carbohydrate receptor sites, those little round things. He says, whoa, whoa, that's not right. So he actually engulfs him, takes him in, digests him, and spits out those receptor sites. Now, normal self receptor sites or self-antigens look like that. These guys come from the bad fellow, and they're expressed differently. Well, this guy's called a helper T cell. He goes around and communicates with the macrophage, and the macrophage says, hey, I found these bad guys. Look, at they look like this, and this guy has receptor sites that identifies those as being abnormal or being bad guys. So cellular communication again. Well, when that happens, the helper T cell calls out the killer cell, the foot slogger, the soldier. And that's the cyto cytoxic, or cytotoxic T cell. And he goes around looking throughout all your lymphatic system, all your blood system, everywhere in the body. Whenever he finds one of those little round, blippy, green little suckers, he says, oh, he's bad. So he attaches on him and actually shoots a little chemical bazooka called a cytokine into it and kills it. You know, it, the immune system is wonderful if it's working properly. If that's a bacteria, a virus, or a cancer cell, or whatever, he knocks it off. Now, this can be a virus. It can be attached onto your 
pancreatic beta cell in your spleen or any other virus attaching anywhere else in your body. And the killer cell, he's the foot slogger, he's, he's the Joe boy, he's the infantry man. He doesn't know and he's not trained to know whether he should attack, not attack or back off or go home or whatever, but he is ordered by either the helper T cell to attack or the suppressor T cell who says, oh, there's no more of these guys around, go on home, take it easy, go back to your spleen or your lymph node, you know, have a holiday, all the bad guys are gone. Now that's, in a perfect world, that's what happens. However, if there's no cellular communication, this virus might attach onto your beta pancreatic cell in your, in, in your pancreas that produces insulin. It can be a, a Coxsackie virus, which is, in itself is very innocuous. However, the Coxsackie is an abnormal, he's the little green guy. Now, if this little green guy is attached onto your pancreatic cell, your foot slogger, your killer cell, just keeps attacking anything that has been attached onto that cell. Unless he's told by the suppressor cell to break off the attack, he keeps attacking, 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 and you destroy your own beta pancreatic uh, cell. You become diabetic type 1. A diabetes, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder where you destroy your own beta pancreatic cells. That's because cellular communication, and if you don't have all the monosaccharides, these cells can't communicate properly, and you will have that uh, abnormality where you keep attacking your own cells. Crohn's disease, fibromyalgia, uh, chronic fatigue are all manifestations of chronic immune diseases. There's another guy here called a memory T cell. A memory cell says, well, you know, first time, you had to identify him, you had to go through all the identification processes, the fingerprinting, the, uh, you, know, you don't have it here, but the CIA or the CIS in Canada, this is a bad guy, we gotta get him all compartmentalized and told that he's no good and we have to prove that he's no good and everything. Well, the memory cell says, well, we already know he's bad, so instead of taking this whole time here to identify, do all the identification processes, he calls out, the cytotoxic T cell right away. This whole process here takes anywhere from 10 to 14 days, and if you're first exposed to measles cells, you're gonna get the symptoms of measles. However, the second time around, if your system is working properly, your immune system is working properly, the memory cell says, we don't have to do all this. He calls out these guys right away, kills off the virus before it can do any damage, and you don't get the measles or the mumps or whatever the second time around, if everything is working right. And you may say, well, that's very nice theoretically, but in fact, does that happen? Well, cancer cells have abnormal receptor sites on them, which is the cancer cell. Here's your regular cells with all their carbohydrate receptor sites. Look at this guy, he's got those little round blips on there. He's the bad guy. Each and every one of us produce, on average, one to 2,000 cancer cells in our body every day. But if our immune system is working right, we get rid of that cancer cell. The killer cells attack a single cancer cell and can get rid of it quite easily. But if your immune system isn't working properly, that ain't gonna happen. And if these guys clump together, and form a little nidus of about five million cells, then your immune system has great difficulty attacking and killing the cells faster than the cells can, these cancer cells, which don't uh, listen to the normal uh, physiological controls of cell cellular replication. They multiply quicker than the attacking killer cells can kill them. So you start over the years growing, growing, growing more cancer cells till eventually you get a clinical cancer. And all you ladies, and some of you guys know about pap smears, well, the initial, when you have cellular abnormalities of the cell surface in your cervical uh, cells, from that stage till clinical development of cervical cancer is a minimum of five to 10 years, probably closer to 15 to 20 years, and the same with any cancer anywhere. A single cellular cancer cell is easily destroyed by your immune system if it's working properly. If it's not, the cancer cells start clumping, but your immune system doesn't give up. They produce a substance called a cellular agglutination factor that doesn't allow or prevents 
these cells from sticking together, and a single cell is nothing. It's not going to cause a cancer. But if you start growing, clumping together, attaching, that's eventually you'll get a cancer. So the immune system produces stuff that prevents this clumping together. And then even after they clump together, if the cell cancer nidus keeps growing, your body produces something called uh, tissue uh, necrosis factor. And this actually walls off the cancer cuts off the blood supply and makes the cancer cells sick. Now again, they can replicate and do everything else, and the cancer cells don't behave normally. They don't respond to the normal physiological bodily mechanisms. But because the cancer is walled off, the cancer is being attacked by your normal killer cells. If the, with the proper nutrition, this effect can be greater, and Dr. Glenn Highland in, in North Dakota, who's a radiation oncologist, says that the use of monosaccharides in the treatment of tumors and cancers enhances the capability of radiation chemotherapy for all the effects I've just mentioned. It, and he recommends that all people with, who, who have to undergo radiation or chemo be on these monosaccharides, and he actually presented a paper to the NIH, National Cancer Institute in, in the US, attesting to this fact of the benefits of uh, nutritional substances in the treatment of various cancers. This is an interesting photomicrograph, and this actually shows what I was just talking about. This is a cancer cell, and these are the killer cells attacking the cancer cells, and this is from a scanning micros uh, electron microscope. What I want to do is talk to you a little bit about the differences between nutritional supplements and pharmaceutical drugs. And I'll go over these in detail. And this is a general difference. As drugs are synthetic, dietary supplements are natural. Drugs are usually single molecule products, whereas the supplements are multifaceted, complex products, not a single molecule. Toxicity is almost is, is of great concern, and you have to take drugs in absolutely precise amounts because of the toxicity and everything else that we've talked about. I mean, doctors are trained and healthcare professionals are trained so many milligrams per kilogram. In other words, absolutely precise dosages. Well, food isn't that way. Some people need more, some people need less. And toxicity is almost never a problem, and precise controls of amounts taken is not necessary. Your body will figure out how much it needs, and it will utilize uh, what it needs. Drugs are designed to interfere with a normal physiological process. It blocks, interferes with, or alters the basic physiological mechanism at the cellular level. Whereas the uh, dietary supplements are designed to support and enhance normal physiological mechanisms within the body. Major difference. One interferes with blocks or alters. The other one enhances and helps your body fix itself at the cellular level. Drugs you take only when you're sick. Dietary supplements you take to keep yourself healthy, to keep your cells healthy. And you know, it's like breakfast. You eat breakfast today, you're going to probably eat breakfast tomorrow, and you're going to eat lunch and so forth. You have to keep using it to help your cells in the whole process of maintaining the nutrition and everything else, whereas drugs you only take when you're sick, which, you know, that's the way drugs are designed. Drugs have an immediate effect, usually within a matter of sometimes minutes or hours. Dietary supplements, it takes a long time for your cells to fix, repair, replicate, heal, and all the things that cells do. So therefore, they have a much slower effect because they, in fact, rebuild your body from the cell up. This is of interest. And I put this up because most people don't realize how many cells we build every day. 500 billion new cells are built every day in our body, 500 billion. It takes an awful lot of all the physiological processes that go on to build that many, many cells. We replace our skin about once a month. 
We replace our liver about once every six weeks. And these are average figures, it's, it's not exact. Our stomach lining, because it's very acidic, you know, pH of one to two, which is roughly the pH of your battery acid in your car. Yet your cells can protect your stomach lining, but they have to be replaced and repaired very, very fast. Bones about every two years, and in addition, our think tank works at six trillion times per second. That's about 6,000 times faster than the fastest computer you can buy. That's not bad for this little thing up here. You know, it's amazing what our bodies uh, can actually do. Now, you have to remember that these supplements are not designed to treat, cure, or ameliorate any disease condition. You always have to check with your healthcare professional. But scientific knowledge and research has established that there is a connection between good nutrition and uh, many disease conditions. The old focus, the old focus said drug therapy. Well, we know now drug therapy is very toxic. 100,000 people a year in North America are killed by properly prescribed drugs. You know, a person may say, well, you know, I wouldn't dare fly, that's too dangerous, but I'm taking X, Y, Z medications. They're taking three, four, or five medications. Well, can you imagine the outcry there would be in the world if a jetliner went down somewhere in the world every day? And just people wouldn't fly anymore. But yet the equivalent of one jet superliner or jumbo jet every day goes down in the US, in North America, the equivalent of that number of many people are killed by drugs that are properly prescribed. And yet the allopathic community says, oh no, you can't give these supplements, they might be dangerous. Mm. I'm not sure where, <laughs> I think I'd a lot sooner rely on allopathic uh, medicine to look after my broken bone or uh, whatever if I was in a car accident but I think I'd like to strengthen my own body to look after my cells at the, at the cellular level. Physician authority, which is great in what they're trained. They're not trained in nutrition, and that's all over Western medicine. You have to take personal responsibility for your own health. You can't just say, I'm gonna take supplements and I'm gonna be healthy for the rest of my days. You still gotta look after yourself. Avoid stress, make sure you get enough rest, try eat as healthy as possible, avoid high glycemic foods because that creates insulin stresses on your body which can create all kinds of problems. You have to be active as Dr. Nimi said this morning, you gotta, you gotta do things to help yourself. You can't just take a magic supplement and expect all these results. You have to be physically active. You have to be emotionally as uh, relaxed as you can. Avoid the things that we know cause uh, deterioration in, in your health. The old focus, the allopathic way says, well, you get sick and then come to me and I'll fix you. Well, we know this really doesn't work anymore. And uh, as I was saying, the healthy lifestyle. External decision making. It's the same here, I'm sure, as it is in Canada, where you have bureaucrats sitting in an office somewhere, as I told you this morning, because my costs were 87 cents per year per patient more. They were going to strip my license because I wasn't being a good boy and doing what the bureaucrats said I should be doing, is looking at the bottom dollar of taxpayers' expenses, because, you know, 87 cents is a lot of money on a patient per year. I mean, that's, that's terrible. So what I'm saying is don't let the bureaucrats or whoever control your life. You've got to take responsibility. Personal empowerment, and that is the key. So with that, I hope you have learned a little bit. I'll be available for questions later on, and uh, I sincerely thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here today and talk to you about it.